Hello and welcome to the future of business, where each week we discuss current business issues that will have a significant impact on the future of business in Ireland and beyond, and explore their possible consequences for people in business and for society more generally. I'm Vincent Wall, and today I'm joined by Alan Murray, private client tax partner with Mazars Ireland, and by Dominic Conlon, head of corporate at Le Mans Solicitors, to discuss the issue of succession planning. Alan, coming to you first, what we're talking about here in terms of succession planning is where a family business, generally parents who've built up a business, are thinking of passing it on to their adult children. In the majority of cases I see, as you have correctly pointed out, it would be parents who are probably in their mid to late 50s uh, who have built up quite a successful business and are now looking at various exit options, um, be that a sale to a third party or more relevant is they're looking to pass the family business on to the next generation, uh, ultimately their children, uh, who may or may not work in the business. Um, But it's important to point out that it's not just family assets that succession planning is relevant to. Um, If people have built up a substantial uh, portfolio of non-business assets, which will be passed on under their will or during their lifetime, that again is encompassed by the phrase succession planning. So it's basically a wide definition of of, of any asset which, which, which clients uh, or individuals are looking to pass on uh, to the next generation. Now, you're a tax partner, and obviously tax will come into the uh, the, the figures, the figuration of, 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 of people entering this process about how to pass on most efficiently. But is that what people should prioritise, the whole question of tax? Absolutely not, Vincent. And it probably goes against, it's probably counterintuitive to me, but uh, tax is one aspect of it, and it's an extremely important um, aspect of it. But effectively, the tail does not wag the dog. Um, just because something is tax efficient, it may not be the correct decision for the individuals to make. Uh, from my experience, the biggest issue that I see, and it's the most important issue, is uh, who effectively gets the business assets and are the people who are earmarked by the parents to take over the business and to run the business, do they have the necessary business acumen and skill set to actually be that, be that um, next generational leader? And that may or may not be the situation. And in my opinion, that is, is, is far more important than the tax consequences. But again, the tax consequences are extremely important because nobody wants to do something which can lead to unintentional tax costs. And we'll come back to that in a second. But Dominic, from a legal perspective, apart from the, I suppose, the ethics of it, is there, are there legal considerations as well in, in, in not only trying to pass on the business efficiently to that person who will take it on best, but also fairness? Yeah, Vincent, uh, there are. um, By and large, lawyers get brought in in tandem with people like Alan and and Mazars. You know, um, estate planning and uh, business planning is um, an exercise that requires both uh, legal advice and tax planning and the human element as well. And in my experience... um, it's difficult to get a good outcome uh, and a good plan at the last minute. These sorts of things require you know, a good bit of thought uh, and a, a, a good bit of lead time and glide path to get an arrangement that actually works for the human beings involved and that gets um, an outcome that's legally robust in the event that somebody falls out with somebody else uh, and the, the, the whole structure has to be challenged and tested. Or, or somebody feels that they haven't been treated particularly yeah. fairly. Yeah, uh, Absolutely. And without one wanting to get into uh, inheritance uh, rights um, and, and family rights, where we tend to see this is where, uh, as, as Alan has mentioned, a uh, husband and wife team who built up a business come into us and they say, look, you know, we own business X, we have you know, two or three kids, we want to provide for them uh, and, and, and make sure that when we pass on, uh, the guys can, can take the business and run with it. And that can be achieved um, through a number of different structures, that's when we say, look, um, have you taken tax advice? You know, and, and that's a very, very important gating issue. And when they come back to us and say, yes, we, you know, we've taken the advice, this is the sort of structure we're looking at, we will then implement something perhaps like a shareholder's agreement where the um, mum and dad and the children all sign up uh, and the kids get a couple of shares up front perhaps uh, and the shareholder's agreement will deal with things such as you know, what happens if you know, the parents become incapacitated uh, or pass on Um, who can take the shares um, uh, in the event of death. It'll also deal with who can the children themselves transfer the shares that they hold to. There may be somebody with um, a capacity issue or or somebody who's just not suitable uh, to hold shares or be actively involved in the business, and that can be dealt with as well in a uh, robust agreement. It needs some careful thought and it needs some honesty uh, in, in, in the family as well. 
but uh, we have regularly put put arrangements in place where perhaps you know the benefit uh, the economic benefit of shares might be held in trust for somebody who the, who the, who the family feel shouldn't actually own the shares directly themselves for one reason or another and i presume a situation where one person uh, hopefully through agreement is picked to take on the business but that other siblings may actually have a, a passive shareholding in that business and 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 how they they get their dividends or income out of it. Yeah, that regularly happens. But but I suppose looking at the human element of it, if your, your first step in planning, you know, that sort of succession is coming to the lawyers and tax advisors, you're probably starting from, from from the wrong place. You know, really, you should have spent some time with your children and worked out who actually wants to be involved and who is right to be involved in the business. Yeah, I mean that's that's critical, Vincent, and it's something that we we commonly see whereby. What I say to clients is the first stage of the actual process is to sit down with your family and to say, well, look, um, you know, Dominic has been running the business with me for 10, 15 years. It's only right and fair. Um, and he has the relevant experience that he or she is the one who gets the gets the shares in the family business. And siblings um, will react to that and they, they need time to absorb that. And one thing that you need to say to them is, well, there, there are other assets there which you will get to compensate you for that. Um, where issues arisen that I've seen where issues really arise is where the children have not been consulted in advance and under uh, somebody's will, uh, all the shares in the trading company or, or whatever are left to, to one family member. And that's where it causes real issues because... It, it, you, you've taken it out of the sphere of it being a tax and a, a legal issue to an emotive issue, mm-hmm. and that's where it becomes a problem. Um, and it, you know, like we're all aware of cases, or we've all heard of cases whereby families have effectively been destroyed due to the fact that somebody who was expecting an inheritance didn't get an inheritance, and it's caused all sorts of issues. Has gone to the court, and the only people who've probably done well out of it are the solicitors and barristers. Mm-hmm. Sorry, Dominic. <laughs> Never an ill wind, as they say. (laughs) Obviously, that process has to take place while the parents planning to pass on the business and other assets are still alive, obviously. But from a purely tax perspective, is there any difference as to whether uh, assets are passed on as a living gift or in a will after death? Absolutely, Vincent. Um, from a tax point of view, debt is actually quite efficient, and um, we don't recommend Good to it. Hear as, that, yeah. we, we, we don't recommend it as a tax planning tool, but there can be benefits. Hard to reverse, though. There can be benefits exactly whereby assets pass under under a will. The primary benefits is that there's no stamp duty for the person who's receiving the inheritance, nor is there capital gains tax for the person who's died. And what people sometimes do not understand um, is that if a gift is made during a lifetime, notwithstanding the fact that you're not paying your parents for the shares in the company, that is still liable to capital gains tax for your parents, um, as if they sold the, the asset to you for full market value. Now, there are various tax reliefs that are there to mitigate uh, and to reduce uh, the cost for both the person who's gi- making the, the gift and the person who's receiving the gift, but the tax reliefs may not be available in all situations. Primarily, the tax reliefs are only available for trading companies. So if you have somebody who owns a number of uh, commercial and residential rental properties through a corporate structure, the gift of the shares in that structure will not qualify for the various tax reliefs because they're not a trading entity. Obviously, every context is different and there are, there are pros and cons as to a living gift or, or, or a will. But it seems to me that, as you say, perhaps a will can be can be cleaner in some respects. But in many instances, you know, and, and this will include farm businesses as much as anything else, the, the parents are becoming too elderly to run the business to encourage uh, the next generation to take it on ownership has to transfer while they're still alive. Absolutely, but I, I also think an important uh, aspect for the people, the parents who are, who are gifting the assets is to, is, to, is to ensure that they have some kind of security in terms of their income. Because um, given, obviously, it's great that people are living longer and people's life expectancy is, is getting longer, but when people, th- that needs, people's lifestyle needs to be funded. So if people are living into their mid-80s, that lifestyle needs to be funded. And if somebody's main um, asset is the shares in a trading business, which they have successfully built up, if they effectively transfer that business to their their son or daughter, lock, stock and barrel, and they resign as a director and there's no shareholders agreement, effectively, it's, it's, they are at the behest of their children, whether they can get an income from that company. And that's a really important point. 
I presume from a legal perspective, uh, uh, Dominic, uh, that those shareholder shareholder agreements you, you alluded to earlier can build in that income protection for, for parents. But can you in a shareholder's agreement cover off every unexpected eventuality? It's difficult, but, but you can co- cover off a lot. But I suppose... R- Reflecting on it, the the emotional piece of it and the reality piece of it cannot be overlooked. Uh, I love the phrase which my father used to say to me, you know, after the gatherer comes the squanderer. Uh, so, you know, when you're looking at, you know, businesses, sometimes you do have to ask yourself, look, I want to provide for my children into the future, but is giving these guys the business the right thing to do? Are they capable of running the business and actually, you know, realizing the value from it? Uh, or are they going to flog it, buy Ferraris and bugger off? Um that has to be a, 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 a consideration, and very often we see people who recognise that perhaps the best thing to do is to involve perhaps um, a, a, a CEO, an independent CEO, you know, to, to come in, nurture that person, and, and crown them as a person who's going to eventually buy the business into the future, or indeed have some sort of um, right to, to, to run the business with the economic benefit flowing to the kids without them being actually involved in the business. We do see that happening quite, quite often. So I suppose the next question question is, are you better off flogging the business and handing over cash to your kids? That's one of the first decisions you have to make. Um, it's difficult to, to, to consider your own mortality. There's no, no doubt about that. And, and this kind of stuff is very difficult for families. The worst scenario, though, is to um, for the parents to die without having planned things properly, particularly where they have a large number of uh, beneficiaries who are entitled to participate, um, be it through a, a will or if, if, if the relevant parents die without making a will. I'm actually currently working on a transaction where we're trying to buy a company um, and the, the, the person who owned the company died, no will. There are about 17 different beneficiaries. It's like herding cats. And consequently, this transaction is dragged on for a year and a half and they aren't going to get the value um, that they should have gotten because the acquirer is is um, finding it virtually impossible to get this thing done. And, and, and that has consequences um, for the passing on of the real benefit in, in, in the business itself. So if, if you take nothing else from this um, talk, plan and get something in place. And, and, and something which, leading on from what Dominic was saying, something other structures that we've looked at is... Um, you know, if the parents do not feel that their children at this stage are mature enough to take over a business, we can look at putting a provision in a will whereby the assets are settled onto a discretionary trust. Um, so the shares go into a trust and effectively the shares may not be appointed out to the children until... Maturity descends upon them. Until maturity <laughs> descends upon them. I mean, I mean, I suppose 30 is the new 21. So you're, you should have a pretty good idea if your children are 30 as to which way they're, they're, they're heading. So what, what is typical is that, especially if you have minor children as well, Vincent, which is another concern for parents, is that you would set up a trust structure whereby on debt, the, assets, the, the business assets would go into a discretionary trust um, which again is tax issues, but as I said, it's it's probably subservient to the commercial issues. And you would appoint either a professional trustee or possibly a professional trustee and a, another trustee who's a lifelong friend of the family and who knows the children. And those t- trustees in tandem would look to appoint the shares in the business out to the children when they feel that the children are ready for that. And from a tax perspective solely, uh, Dominic mentioned there that one of the considerations might be whether to sell the business and just distribute the cash to kids or to, to pass it on as an active business. Are there tax considerations in, in making that decision in terms of the tax reliefs you might get from inheriting an active business? Well, I suppose looking at it from the context of the people who are selling the business, be it the parents, there are a couple of valuable tax reliefs. Um, I, I won't get into it in, in, in minutiae, but they're, broadly speaking, there's capital gains tax retirement relief and capital gains tax entrepreneurs relief, which if certain conditions are met, by both the individual selling the shares and the business, it is possible to have a tax saving on the business. I suppose one thing <clears throat> in the context of, of selling a business and gifting cash, there is a relief from gift and inheritance tax called business property relief, which if certain conditions are met, the value of the gift will be reduced by 90% for the purposes of calculating tax. That will apl- That should apply depending on the conditions to the gift of a business. It will not apply to the gift of cash. Okay. Um, which is an important point to bear in mind. What about the thorny issue, and I suppose the growing issue, uh, Dominic, of of second families? Mm. You know, the the children of a a second relationship uh, who who may feel they have equal rights to... uh, to the assets, whether the business assets or other assets being passed on. You know, we come across this quite a lot. Um, I suppose to date in the talk, we've been speaking about shareholder agreements and, and arrangements 
kind of focus specifically on companies. There is a concept which has come from uh, continental Europe of what's called a family constitution. And it's in effect an agreement which each family member who's going to be participating in um, the, the arrangement signs up to and where the parents set out their wishes and everybody agrees how they will interact with, with each other in relation to the wealth that's been generated by the parents going forward. Uh, and that's a very useful document which, which we see more and more. But drilling into the specifics, um, shareholder agreements, we would see them quite often where, for example, the, the parents might hand over 90% or 99% of the economic benefit in the shareholding in the company to their siblings, but they might retain one what's called a golden share, where this share gives them the right to appoint a majority of the directors uh, um, to effectively drive the business as they see it should be driven in the event that somebody goes off the rails. Uh, um, so we've seen that quite a lot. That's only useful for as so long as the parents themselves are alive. We've seen provisions, um, um, and we put provisions regularly into shareholder agreements which say, look, um, there might be three children. Um, these shares can only be transferred um, to you know, the, the other children um, w- within the family group. They can't be transferred to family members. Um, we've seen provisions which say in the event of death of a family member or you know, divorce, etc., etc., any purported transfer of shares to the the uh, the partner, you know, the the, the divorce partner, or uh, outside the family is effectively null and void. And, and will those will those so called insurance clauses will they stand up in court? They they have been tested in court. Um, there's no doubt that uh, it's suboptimal having to go into court and actually enforce these things. But unfortunately, that's sometimes what has to happen, um, and, and that's why you get lawyers involved. We talked about about the range of other assets that that parents uh, may be in a position to pass on, uh, Alan, um, uh, and they they could include assets overseas. So I assume there are there are tax and other implications uh, involved there. Absolutely, Vincent. I mean, it's not uncommon now for um, people who've generated significant uh, levels of wealth to have a holiday home abroad, be it at France, Italy, Spain. And one thing, one, one thing that people need to bear in mind, uh, not only in the context of succession planning, is to make sure you get tax advice on the ground in that jurisdiction as to what happens when you, you die. And commonly on a debt, people will leave their assets to their spouse. And in Ireland, there's no inheritance taxes between spouses, but that may not be the situation in the foreign country. So you need to take succession planning advice in that in that jurisdiction to to see exactly what happens to that asset when you die. First of all, um, is there any any particular quirks in the domestic legislation in that country which could prevent you from passing the asset uh, to whoever you wish? Um, and secondly, if you leave the asset to your husband or wife, will there be any local tax there? Because if there's local tax there, that's a real cost. And if there is local tax on transferring the asset inter spouses on a debt, you may consider leaving the asset to somebody else other than your spouse. So if there is tax in, say, Spain, that the Spanish tax can be used as a credit against the Irish tax. Now, I'm probably getting a bit technical here, but what I'm trying to allude to is that... But be mindful of the fact that there could be different arrangements overseas. That's it, exactly. Yeah. One thing, Vincent, actually, which I want to touch on before I forget is the issue of insurance, which is quite important. Important. We see a lot of clients coming to us looking to utilise insurance to ensure that the right outcome is achieved. First thing to, to mention, and I've seen this affect family members, personal family members, where they mistake um, insurance which a company that the relevant spouse owns takes out in relation to that spouse's life, but where the beneficiary is the company itself. Uh, and I've seen that being misinterpreted as an insurance, you know, a life insurance policy which will benefit the, the, the spouse who doesn't die directly. Um, so one thing to take away is go and check your life insurance policies and make sure that if someone dies, that the, the intended recipient is the person who will actually receive the benefit of that policy. And the purpose of that insurance would be that it would provide a sum for the, for the, uh, for the beneficiary to allow them to, to, to buy their share in the business or whatever? Well, that's one of the, 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 the purposes of life insurance policies. I suppose... You, you do need to check what you actually want. It may be that you think a life insurance policy, as many of us do, should be, look, uh, if I die, I want a sum of money to go directly to my wife or to my children. Not all life insurance policies do that. As I said, quite a lot of them uh, are taken out in the name of a company you own and the beneficiary will be the company itself. Uh, and, and, and that mightn't be the result which you want to achieve. 
Turning then to insurance policies which, which are put in place to actually fund an acquisition of shares, we do see that quite a lot. There are a number of, of, of reasonably complex company law points which need to be jumped through, but those policies are available in the market. And the concept is, you know, um, uh, I own shares in Dominic Condon Limited. Um, I want, when I die, for the company to be able to you know, buy my shares back and actually fund my estate, perhaps. Or I want, when I die, for Alan to be able to, you know, to, to be funded to to uh, buy the shares from me. So it is possible for the company to fund the cost of those policies if the right company law steps are jumped through. Um, And it was very fashionable up until the crash, died away after the crash, coming back again. Finally, a a, a question to both of you, and and I suppose we're into slightly nebulous territory here, but it's it's extremely clear to me that uh, good advice is required here on both the the tax and legal side. do advisors just simply follow the dictates of of their clients in this sort of area, or can you guide uh, can you guide them to to make decisions based on your own knowledge of the of of the the children that the assets are being passed on to? I, I think I think certainly in the context of of the commercial decisions, Vincent, and the tax decisions, um, hopefully your your clients will listen to what what we're saying. Um, where it becomes emotive is if you're basically saying, well, we don't think that Dominic, who's your eldest son, is probably the best person to be running the business because we think he'll run it into the ground within six months. That that can be emotive. And really, as an advisor, um, as a trusted business advisor, while you, know, you, you, you can have that conversation with your client, uh, you need to be very careful. And, and you can give an honest um, professional opinion as to whether you think the best management team are in place. But ultimately, that is the client's decision. Um, and they can pass the assets to whoever they wish. Uh, and we can outline the tax issues. But, you know, it almost behoves you as a, you know, not just being a, a tax advisor, but a trusted business advisor to protect the interests of your client and to protect the actual shares in the company. And that's something, but, but, but again, that needs to be handled diplomatically and it all depends on your relationship with your client. I mean, if you've been dealing with your client for 20 years, you have a trusted relationship with your client, that conversation is easier than if it's a new if it's a new, a new client who is coming in to specifically talk to you about succession planning um, and you feel that after meeting the, the, the family members, you feel um, from a couple of conversations you've had with somebody that maybe the children are not the best people. Maybe, maybe a management buyout would be a better option. Mm. Uh, Alan's taking my line there um, trusted business advisor but that's what I uh, want to be when, when people come in uh, I, I am not a document drafter or an executor I'm a business advisor um, and after the advice has been given you know, utilising my experience um, then the documentation is drafted and executed but I'm doing nobody any favours if, if someone just comes in and says I want flavour A when I know flavour B is a flavour that they should be, really be thinking about so um, you know, my job is to make sure that all the issues which Alan has spoken about are thought about discussed uh, and uh, your client has had an opportunity to actually make an informed decision We'll leave it there, lads. Uh, 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 I suppose a relatively grim topic in the in the in the weeks coming up to Christmas, but nonetheless, uh, an absolute a, a decision that that is facing so many people. And one of the the key to- the key messages that I've taken from this chat uh, with you, Alan and 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 Dominic of Le Mans solicitors, is that. Uh, planning needs to start as early as possible, uh, and and planning involves. Serious, mature conversations with the children that you're 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 planning to pass on to, or 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 not, as the case may be, that the the tax and legal implications need to be taken into account. But that, but that that's not the the critical issue. The the critical issue is prioritize initially what is best for the business and assets you're passing on, and what is fairest uh, and best for the future of those assets. Until the next time, take care. Thank you for listening to The Future of Business with Vincent Wall and Mazars. We welcome any feedback to our podcasts and particularly your suggestions as to topics we should cover. You can comment and rate us wherever you find this podcast or on mazars.ie. Bye for now.